Okay, we should be live. Chris Whalen CPA is back, and I'm just going to apologize. I don't know. People probably would never have noticed, but I noticed that I stink right now, and that's because I went for a run thinking I was going to make it back in time to take a shower before this, but I got stuck in traffic with a car accident, and so thankfully Chris cannot smell me. I know you all are thinking... You always look terrible, Allison. That's the good news. That's the good news. You know, there were people in the news business that I used to work with who would come into work totally camera ready, as they say. And I used to get in trouble sometimes for not coming to work camera ready. But here's the thing. When you never wear makeup or you always look like you need a shower, then nobody notices when you actually do, right? So it's it, just a word to the wise, everybody. Like, if you always look terrible, no one's going to notice. They're not going to notice when you just decided, I'm not putting in the effort today. And that goes to our story for today, putting in the effort to go back to work. Swipe your badge or get fired. Employers and workers face a reckoning over returning to the office. Chris, why don't you just give us your opening thoughts on what's going on here? Because this article almost makes it sound like certain companies like Amazon, for instance, are, are starting to go a little big brother over this particular topic, like tracking employee behavior and whatnot, because there there is such resistance to going back to the office after everybody got to work from home over the last few years. Right. Well, um, the, the main thing, one thing you're talking about, people being camera ready, a lot of people don't fit into the clothes they used to wear for work. So they're going to have a, 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 bu a budgeting issue with their clothes they need to buy. That's true. That's a good point. Well, I'm just seeing I have I have a bunch of groups that I talk to, sort of private groups at different levels, executives or managers. And so a lot of them, most of them love being home working. And most of them have seen even productivity gains, which I think is the most important question here. It does, you know, do we have to get back to the office so we're more productive or, you know, has productivity suffered? And everyone I'm talking to, they, they're saying no for the most part. So I think that's an important consideration. A lot of workers are saying, hey, we're, our, 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 our work is, is fantastic. Why go back to the office? There's no need for, a biz, for a business reason or profit and loss reason you know, to go back to the office, which I think is a very important point. So what I'm seeing is the writings on the wall with some even medium-sized companies, a lot of large companies in the me major metropolitan areas that they're going to be requiring even more on-site work or even full-time work. And I'm getting a lot of very interesting comments and thoughts from all different levels of people. You know, so the, the, the message really is if you think, if you're, a, if you're a very important manager, team leader, salesperson, um, those skills are, are universal skills. And uh, the job market has really opened up, you know, to, to being an international scene right now. So, these 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 high these high value salespeople and managers, you know, really feel that they don't have to go anywhere they don't want to go. So I think there's there's a difference between line working clerical people, right? We have to look at the at the types of employees and their respective importance uh, to the organization. So the less important you are technically, the less power you're going to have to resist this. All right, let's read a little bit here. Employers across corporate America are hardening their demands for workers to return to their cubicles and rebuffing employee resistance. But workers are ready for this battle. Amazon's top human resources representative rejected an internal petition signed by roughly 30,000 employees over the company's return to office policy. Apple is tracking employee attendance and has threatened action against staff who don't work from the office at least three days a week. And in March, Elon Musk emailed Twitter staff at 2.30 a.m. to remind them of the company's policy. Platformers Zoe Schiffer tweeted, the office is not optional. This was I thought was funny. I guess this is Chipotle, Chipotle corporate, not the guys and gals who are actually making your burrito, because it would seem weird to me if they were making your burrito from home. I don't know. But it <laughs> says Chipotle told workers... They would have to head into the office four days a week, according to Bloomberg. The fast food chain, which had been requiring workers to show up three days a week, announced the shift in late May, according to the report. And in May, groups of Amazon corporate workers walked out in part to protest the return to office policies, though I know Amazon has had its issues with uh, protests and whatnot. There are lots of people that protest working for Amazon for several different reasons. But anyway, I'll be honest with you, Chris, like, since a lot of what I do here is skepticism of the of the 
corporate press narrative around this, I kind of sit back and wonder, like, is this really what's going on? Or what are what are they not telling us? Or why are they drumming up the drama over it? Do you have any thoughts about that? Because I, I don't necessarily want to just take this, this as a hook, line and sinker, like big guy versus little guy or whatever it is, workers versus employers. If it isn't, if it isn't really something that's, that's uh, at issue. And I, you know, I do a lot of media analysis on the show and frankly, a lot of it's wrong. So what do you think about that? Well, I think, uh, I think that there is, there, there's a lot to this topic though, of things happening, but the media, of course, they always want to make a David and Goliath situation. They always want to have a versus, you know, so that's their way, whether it be political or employment. So I don't, I, I guess the, the fact that they might be overblowing this a little bit makes perfect sense to me based on their history. You know, they want people to feel aggrieved. They want you to feel bad when you watch the news. They want you to be pitted against the corporate bosses or whomever they want you to be, 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 be pitted against. So I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised to see how the media is covering this. And I, and I think the Amazon walkout was really just a lunchtime thing. And so I think that's also what you just read is biased. You would think they had a walkout for days. They're negotiating. I think they just went outside on the grassy area outside the office at lunchtime for a few minutes with some signs. So that's a great example of media not really portraying the truth of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is kind of a good point. So Kat Obi says, I don't understand the problem. We always had to go to the office. Yes, it was a waste of time, but that was life. They're paying you, so I guess they have the last word. It's a small guy who hurts. What do you think about that? Um, you know, it's not like it's not like for this was just the way it was for forever. It's sort of a relatively new phenomenon, I guess, in in the extent of the amount of of companies that did at home work. So just kind of for a lot of them, it's just returning to the way it used to be. What, what, why not just say, oh, this is, this was the job I signed up for. Well, well, know? I think, well, well, let's just back up a little, little bit. So okay. the employment, employment is a contract, right? It's really a business contract between you and a, a company. And so it's about, it's leverage who has leverage and who wants to still fulfill their obligations of their contract of employment. But, but how, how do you want to work, do the work and where do you want to do the work? So I think that's what's happening here. If the companies had leverage, ultimately, then everyone has to go back to work. I think the point of the main point of the podcast I just did and me being here is to say, yes, that's that's old thinking. Twenty five years ago, you would never imagine that people could work from home, even if they had the Internet. Right. But now now, like I said, there's there's so much there's there's so much open space now with regard to working from home or even finding other employers. So that's really the question. Who has the leverage? in this contract between us. And so I, I, my point is that I think that companies, a, a lot of the people I'm talking to that are in these higher positions, the important positions, of course, they're going to go back um, um, as soon as they need to, but of course they're looking for other work right away. So I think the large corporations that aren't flexible enough are going to see a brain drain that they're not going to really appreciate. They already are having a hard time with profits in some of the major fortune 500 companies. So people will go back. I don't foresee people just quitting. Of course, they they want their paycheck, but I think you're going to see over the next first or second quarter after this is done that there, people are really going to be going back to work from home for a different company, maybe some an international company. So it's leverage. If you feel you have leverage and you and you are very employable outside your current position, well then that's what you're going to do. If you love to work at home, and who doesn't love to work at home? And that's where you're going to eventually work if you have the leverage to do so. Okay, Chris, let's um, take a look at your website real fast. Hang on, everybody. I'm going to be back on screen in one second. Um, I would like to, however, just let everybody know that I do have a couple new affiliate partners. So if you are interested in taking a uh, extra boost for vitamin D. I, I actually did a video about how I'm going to try to find what I take. It's right here. Um, I did a video about how I resisted cavities for three years and I didn't even go to the dentist. I do this fermented cod liver oil and concentrated butter oil blend. And, um, green pastures has, uh, has uh, become an affiliate partner. So if you already buy this stuff, which is great, um, my dad is a big, a big fan of it too. He's a surgeon, knows all about bone health and everything. 
Um, this is what he started taking many years ago to avoid getting root canals. It's uh, a great product and they've got lots of other stuff. This is all like food-based nutrition supplements, not just like a pill. Um, so there's a link in the description, the video description for that. If you want to click on that link and buy any of that, there's also always allisonwinepromo.com, allison with one L wine promo.com. You get 50% off the wine and 50% off shipping extremist altitude wines. You all know the drill. If you want to be an extremist, you don't want to go to federal prison. It's a great way to dip your toes in. And it, uh, one from almost 9,000 feet, one from the oldest vineyard in Argentina, uh, one from what else? hand harvested grapes, natural fermentation. They're just great wines in general. They're very remote, small, small family owned operations and a great way to support my work. And then also we have twininginecoffee.com slash Alice and twininginecoffee.com slash Alice and your coffee drinker. This is organic coffee, USDA certified organic, also extremist altitude, light roast, dark roast, espresso, whatever you want, they've got it. And also they've got tea if you're a tea drinker. So go check out there. And then also if you were around for the hydroponic interview, you can also go to eatinggrowsystems.com slash Allison if you're interested in learning about getting a hydroponic system you want to grow indoors. They are also an affiliate partner. So thanks to all the sponsors. Chris, chriswhalencpa.com is where you can follow Chris. He has a podcast. He also is a, a very hardworking CPA, the hardest working CPA I know. And he takes clients, right, Chris? So if people actually want you to work on their business, they like what you say today. They can give you a call 732-673-0510 and even hire you. Um, let, let's go back to what you were talking about regarding um, the, I guess, the leverage that you feel like the companies, you think they're kind of overshooting, that it's a different era. That, 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 the, the era of work we're living in right now is different. And, and I, I was wondering too, if you ha if you had any, background or an opinion, I guess, on what we're seeing, like when we show up at restaurants and it says, Hey, we, we don't have enough staff. So the wait time right. is going to be twice what it used to be. You know, what's driving all of that? Well, the, the demographics drive it, right? So we have in current generations, you know, there's just fewer people, you know, if you look at the baby boomers, they had a certain number of mil millions of births. So we just, we just have fewer younger people who are able to take some of those jobs. So that makes perfect sense to me. Plus, there are people that that don't want to work. There's uh, there's there's a whole different conversation about, especially young men that are living at home. They're not really working outside the house. I think it's seven million uh, was the uh, was the current number that I was reading about. Um, so, regardless of why, the why doesn't matter. It's just that they, that we have a need for employees across the board. I mean, all my all my my customers and clients are looking for for workers, especially tech technically skilled workers in areas. And I just think this is going to continue again as the, the, the demographics, which we talked about in one of our other interviews, demographics are changing. So let's say we had, a, we had a certain number of boomers that have gone through the employment system and that's almost 25 or 30% more than the generations that followed. We simply don't have the man or woman power to fill in the jobs at every level right now, just because of simple demographics. And the other thing to remember, a very important point um, about, about working, going back to the office, it's really going to be a pay cut for people. Remember, because I'm not, if you're not commuting, you, you actually got to raise instantly. Every day you work from home increases your pay because of you don't have to pay for commuting anymore. So people are, you know, money's tight, inflation's high. So if you're going from central Jersey to Manhattan to commute, well, that's an enormous expense five days a week now that you were used to not paying. And so people have to think about it. Well, am I willing to take a pay cut? So, and that's something that people aren't thinking about, but it's um, it's a really important consideration. They've gotten used to two years of no commutation expense. I'm here. My computer. Oh, no, that's all right. Right. Again. So I think I again I think that com well, what are companies going to say? Now, people are used to their pit net pay being higher because they're not paying commuting. Right. So yeah. now they got to, so let's say it's another 100 bucks a week or every two weeks to commute. Who's paying that? Because people have already, it's in, they had their budget now doesn't include the commutation. Everyone, everyone gravitates towards what their, what their payouts are. So they're going to have to decide, oh my God, I'm, I used to pay this, but now it's not part of the budget anymore. 
And yeah. that's happened. I've talked to a lot of people about that. And some commutes are very expensive. Well, and also everybody's time has value too. And it's like, you know, would I pay someone a certain amount of money to not have to be in the car for two hours today? You know right. what I mean? Because I mean, it's the same as, yeah, it's the same as like losing the money on gas or whatever. Like I'd rather take the pay cut or not have the money and not have to deal with that. I don't know. I, I had a, my, I had a deal with DNR that I work from home because I had, I had editing equipment and everything that, you know, I, I prefer it as my, you know, as my personal equipment was way better than anything they had. And, and it was a lot faster and everything. So, you know, they signed me on it. I had a deal where I would work from home, but I remember about, well, right before they fired me, they were starting to tell people to come back. So, and there was resistance. I mean, I remember people being like, why are we doing this? I, this is right. dumb. We've been, you know, we've been handling it from home for the last year. We shouldn't have to do this. And I think a lot of people quit when the hammer finally came down. It was just like, I just, I, you know, right. in, in other words, they didn't like love the job anyway. And then it was just the, it was just the final straw. It wasn't like they loved the job and it was, and this was just the one thing they couldn't, you know, they just couldn't accept. It was like, it was already kind of pushing them in the direction. They're just like, you know what? Forget it. I only like this job because I could work from home. I don't like it anymore. I don't want to go back to work. Right, I, I realized how much I hate it. And remember a lot of this is pressure from the state and federal government, right? So we have all these states now with, uh, you know, um, vacant office space up to 30, 40, 50% and growing. Um, and the problem is that if I were to tell my, <clears throat> excuse me, my employees that I want you to come back to work because productivity is down, sales are down, but they can't do that in 99% of the situation. So that's why there's something else at play. Why do you want me back to work when there isn't a business reason? Right. That's what I, that's all be what I'm talking to when I'm imparting to them. If they can show me that there's going to be a productivity gain for the company, then am I obligated to go into work to the office to work? M most likely, yes, but that's not what's happening. P everyone I'm talking to for years now at every different level, VPs, board members, you know, there's no problem. Like, for example, all my sales team managers I talk to at a high level, they're, they're having no problem at all. It's even seen some increases. And in, so, I think that's there's, there's no reason there is no good business reason for people to come back. And until someone can show us that, I think they're going to have a hard time and people are going to be leaving in droves. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go over to alisonmar.locals.com where you can support my work, be on my editorial board and put questions in ahead of time for interviews. It's a great way to support my work and go one on one with some of the most censored people on the Internet. Chris, any of your clients own commercial real estate? If so, how are they doing? And that's from DMC. Grumpy old man follows up with, I see a lot of empty downtown offices. Well, the the further you get away from major major metropolitan areas, like medium or smaller size commercial, they've been doing okay. Um, but the, the real impact for, for them that's been negative is not just work from home. It's just that the, that COVID, the lockdowns, destroyed a lot of smaller businesses that were using them. The larger companies in the bigger cities could weather that storm. So yes, large commercial real estate, which have a lot of clients in major metropolitan areas, are dramatically suffering not only from a lack of rent, but of course the fair market value of their properties have, are, are plummeting. You know, So what we're having is major commercial real estate with mortgages on them are now well underwater which is a very big problem for some of them. So no, they're definitely they're definitely feeling the the hurt, uh, especially the, the when you get to the, the, when you get to larger metropolitan areas and even locally here, the retail space is empty. Commercial office space is definitely is definitely empty. Some people let their leases go even locally or regionally because people are working from home. See, that's one thing the the big companies don't understand. They've trained these high-level technical people, marketing people, salespeople, managers, and at a high corporate level. And so if they push those people to come back to work, then my smaller to medium-sized clients are going to love poaching them. They're going to love that they're, they're doing it now. And so a couple of years ago, there was a prestige working for a large corporation. They wouldn't go to a smaller company, but everything's changed now with work from home, like I said, with priorities. And so... You're going to see this, this, I'm seeing it now, this brain drain in two ways. One, 
smaller companies without with smaller companies with flexibility are getting these people to come work for them. And that's number one. Um, and then, and then, and also the pay is usually, even if the pay is not as high, they want the flexibility. They're willing to take a pay cut, a slight, which is something that would, you'd never think of 25 years ago. So all these things are acting against the large corporations. So, I mean, I, and the other, the other thing that's happening, um, I probably have had three times the number of new client, uh, startup meetings this year than I had usually have all from fortune 500 people that see the writing on the wall. They don't like the, the, the uh, DEI, ESG stuff going on, all the diversity, equity, inclusion. So they want to get out of there too. So all these things are making these top people in different areas come to me to start their own consulting companies. Mm. I'll get them. I'm up three times the level of those startup type of meetings this year, all because wow. of these things going on. So I'm on the street level. I see it in my numbers and my meetings, what's happening. So, so, it, so it's a real, it's a real thing that people are, people have more control now. Uh, they don't have to go back to the office. That's what my work is showing me that the leverage is not all on the corporate side. I see. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I look at me, I, I, you know, I, I, I actually kind of pitched what I do now to my old company and they thought I was crazy. So <laughs> Worked out for both of us, I guess. They got rid of me and uh, I get to do whatever I want now. Grumpy old man, my company is having this problem. They have been working on it for almost a year. And Bob Whittlefish, I have a friend who works for Amazon that's gotten the demand to go back into the office. Though the funny thing is all his team members are remote. So he would be in the office alone. He's working on getting an exception approved. It just goes to show there are big trends at play. Opposite of that, I see most tech startups now assuming no office remote, only employees by fault, uh, default. I think forcing everyone to do one thing or the other is a bad move for some jobs, some people, some companies. It makes good sense. I, you know, any thoughts on that? But also, um, I know people who now, like for these tech startups, or not, you know, even some of the bigger companies, are are giving uh, or getting, I should say unlimited PTO. They have like unlimited PTO. You know, you could say now my theory on that is that people take less PTO when they have unlimited. That's, that's what I guess versus if you have five weeks PTO, I bet you a million bucks, you take all your five weeks. That that's my guess. And I think my company did this with sick days. They, they made sick days and PTO days the same. So it was like, right. you, could, you know, you just, all you did, you didn't have to like say I'm taking a sick day or whatever, but what I found was that more people came to work sick, you know, because they wanted right. to save their PTO. It's like, whatever, you know, you want to do that. You want to do that. I'm not going to lie. I was one of those people. <laughs> I want to save my vacation days. But, um, you know, I, I, I also think I was more hesitant to, you know, not use up at all, but ha say they had given right. me unlimited. I right. might've said, Oh, I feel bad. I just took a vacation last month, but if I had five weeks, I like, man, I got to take a vacation every other well, I, I, I did think, towards the end. I, I think we have to remember that the idea of PTO or vacation days really applies when we're going to the office because in, in remote work, I do it minute by minute, right? I have a PTO five minutes. I'm back at work the next five. So that's sort of irrelevant in a way. Because people are having a day where there's personal time now, nine to five, business time, or working later. So it's it's really, it's not as significant. And the other thing about startups and, and leverage here, or companies that don't need you to come to work, remember, the younger the person you're dealing with who's an owner of a company, the more that they are, they, they don't understand bricks and mortar anyway. Like I, when I was 16, I worked at McDonald's, for example. So if you have a 30 year old tech person or business person that I'm meeting, they bricks and mortar doesn't matter to them. There is no prestige to it. There is no need for it. They're all virtual anyway. So to think of taking 25 and 30 year olds and force them into an office, that's very unnatural for them. We had it since, I mean, being so old as I am, but you got to remember that it's, it's a much more natural working environment, being home or being virtual. And that's something these big companies don't get. We're not dealing with 60 year old people who grew up without the internet and understand how they feel a safety right. or they feel an affinity to the office. So it's yeah. uh, like, but back to the PTO days, like that's, it doesn't matter. So during the day now I'm home, let's say, um, I can go pick up my kids from three to three 30, get the bus stop. Could have a half an hour PTO time. It just comes down to the main point of all of this is productivity. 
Companies don't care if you're getting the work done. And so this is the mindset that I try to teach some high-end managers. They're still stuck on, I want to get productivity for every hour I'm paying you. And that's not how it works today. If Allison can do a job for 5,000 a week and she could do it in four hours and I could do it in eight hours, it doesn't matter. You're getting 5,000 a week. And so that's where it comes down to productivity is the key. And if, if we, if we can't increase productivity by bringing you back to the office, people are going to say, why am I going back? They're logical. And that's what I'm seeing. I haven't had one company, maybe scientific. They have to be, they have to be on in the office, something physical, some labor, Technical labor has to be there, of course. But if you're simply doing something that involves words or calculations, I could be on the moon. It doesn't matter. So I, I think that companies are going to lose. It's going to be this brain drain continues. And you got to remember, they don't know who they're talking to. They do these universal kind of edicts. But a 25-year-old is much different than a 55-year-old. And they have no idea who they're dealing with. You tell a 25-year-old today, and, they, and some people see them, 25-year-olds, as, they're lazy. They, they want certain accommodations, but they're smarter. They want a work-life balance. So they don't need to be in an office. It's much, it's odd to them to have to go to the office to do anything ever. So, and they, because they got used to virtual learning in high school and college and to say, why would now this archaic company want me to go work in a, in, in, in an office cubicle? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. I will say, I do think it might be a little bit different if you're if your employer is a government department versus a private company, simply because what I noticed having worked for both the, the private sector and public sector is in the private sector, it was exactly what you described. It was like, as long as I made my deadline at five o'clock, my bosses didn't care if I rode a unicycle all day while shooting my video, <laughs> you know, they didn't care. I, I, if I, if I could, if I wanted to take a two hour lunch break, they didn't care. They didn't even, they didn't even ask, you know, they didn't ask what was going on. Like they just, if my story made air and it was a sound piece of reporting or not, we see in the media, they don't care about that anymore, but you know, but you know, if it made its deadline and it, you know, it, it didn't have a bunch of mistakes in it or whatever, then they, they didn't ask any questions about how it got done. The government on the other hand would rather you be a year late on your product Right. As long as you follow all protocol, like every last step has to be followed. And if you finish your work faster, but you skip this or that step or you didn't file this or whatever. Yeah, they don't want it. And I learned very early on, like when I would suggest ideas like, well, what if we did this or what if we did that? No, they don't want that. I mean, I'm not saying every department's that way, but I would just say like who I work for. And I heard this story over and over from other friends. It's just like, do your job, follow the protocol. And if you don't get your job done, that's fine. But as long as you, as long as you were in line and you like, you, you did this step and then that step and then that step. And it's like a bean counter thing. I mean, they just want you and, and it's, and, and I was totally fine. Like I remember, you know, the head of like our commissioner of public lands, who's an elected official, she wanted to have a report from every department about like what they were working on so that she could talk about it in her speeches. And she wanted it monthly. And I remember my, my boss, the communications director was like, I don't know how we're going to get this done. Like what the, the department heads can't get you what they're doing once a month, you know? <laughs> so, right. so no, they've got all these other things they got. And, and it, I, you know, maybe that's because it's law, you know, it's like, it's, it's an ethical, like, or a legal issue for government employees. I don't know, but I, I can just say that it's definitely true in, in private companies, corporate America that like, yeah, it's like productivity. It's all about getting the product product done. But in the government, it was, I, I found it to be the exact opposite. And, I'd rather and, you have nothing done, but follow all the steps. And I, I, I mean, I deal with the IRS, so I see exactly who you're talking about. The other thing, let's talk about human resources a little bit. So most of this conversation is about existing employees. How are they going to handle this, this directive? Right. But that's even short-sighted because we have to deal with we need new people to come in, new interns, new new people who are starting. We want the brightest and the best people who are motivated, young people out of college and um, who are smart and ready to go. And so they're not even applying. So the 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 the, the incoming stream of employees is going to dry up, which they need to train. And so people aren't even talking about that. And I talk about it all the time. So what's going to happen now if uh, Bank of America suddenly says five days a week work in the Manhattan office, 
People coming out of college are not going to even go to their table at the job fair because they're researching all of this. The younger people I talk to, they're on, they, they are very much on top of work environment, culture, quality of life. And the moment that then the moment they're going to see someone man, has mandatory five days or even three days, they're not even going to apply there. So that's also going to be a brain drain before they're even hired, a retroactive kind of it. So, and I try to tell all these managers, I need to deal with HR people in my small, medium and larger companies. You have to go talk to the owners of the companies to tell them that this impact is going to be great. We're not even going to have interns to work here to help us in the future. And so that's something that, that these companies are not thinking about. Again, who are the powers that be, you know, being a conspiracy theorist sometimes, because New York is, 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 is bankrupt, New York City. And part of that are is real estate taxes and income taxes. So they're putting pressure on the companies to get people back to work because the companies have the companies don't want to pay the rent. You think Bank of America wants to keep their office in Manhattan when no. when product when productivity is not hurt? Who would no absolutely it doesn't make logical business sense. They'd want people to come back in to keep their expenses high. So that's why they're not being honest. And people see they're being disingenuous. So that's turning them off also. Okay. Uh, DB Cook, last employer did this, told me I was remote, then reneged after I moved out of the area. I commuted for a time, but got offered another fully remote, gave my employer a chance to amend their policy, but ultimately walked. It has worked out good for me. And JV, I work in IT and find little value in sitting in an office. All of my customers are hundreds or thousands of miles away, and my team is spread across the globe. On the other hand, I see where the majority of very young workers do not look healthy. A great number are obese and some are morbidly obese. Has work from home caused health problems? And does the concept of the office need to be rethought? Does he see any evidence of companies taking these issues seriously? Um, uh, only my small to medium sized cut clients who don't have the cushion of, of cash in the bank, they have to be in tune with what the employees want. So yes, for the larger companies though, they have, they're monolithic. They have no concern for people's lives. Um, again, it's just very odd to me. They're doing everything they can to push people away. And that some of the comments were good, especially remote work. I urge everyone to start to think of the value that they give instead of an hourly rate, because we're not in the office anymore. So we should think about, I'm getting this work done. What is it worth? Not how many hours am I clocking in? And so you might be able to get the work done in 20 hours a week of what a, a regular 40 hour person could do. So you should get paid for the 40 hour person's wage or salary. So very important to start thinking about your value that you give, not just in, not just in terms of the number of hours that you're doing a task. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kenny Eagle. Is there a sense of what level of employees are complaining as an entry level, middle management, et cetera? I personally lost my job at the start of COVID unrelated to COVID when the company I worked for declared bankruptcy. I do enjoy working for myself from home now, yet I sometimes miss the camaraderie of the office environment. What about you, Allison? Um, no, I mean, there are some people I, I miss, I guess, but they were like, they were like buddies. Um, you know, so I would have, if, if I want to see you, I I'll see you or talk to you outside of the office. I don't need to see you at work. I, I, I was a pretty like nose down, get it done. I want to get out of here kind of person. <laughs> you know, I like to work fast and get my thing done. I don't like to like sit around and, and, chat um though you know not to say like some of my my coworkers weren't valuable for that there were lots of smart people i worked with but no i don't really miss it and i i think what i've gained like raising kids and i don't know the camaraderie of like my neighbors i guess i get it that way you know the neighbors the local farmers that i have time to now visit uh being with the kids that's that has been far more rewarding than then the office people, and then plus think about it, you know, Chris, there was this one time several years ago, back when locals was just starting out. And there was a call that we were a bunch of the like new creators who had joined locals uh, was on and like, we could all see each other. And it was Dave Rubin and Scott Adams and, and Eric Hunley and Viva Fry and, you know, just a bunch of us. And I was looking at this, like, this is my new newsroom. And I'm not in the same place as these people. But there's a lot of camaraderie too among the folks who are doing what I do, even if we don't necessarily meet each other. You know, we talk with each other and we're a lot more like minded, I think, than some of the folks that I worked with anyway. So I just find it to be, um, I don't know, more interesting and rewarding. And, and like, again, not to like poo poo, but so, like I said, I had a lot of friends in the industry, I still do, and 
and um, really enjoy them. But when I was at work, like, I just want to get out. <laughs> I, mean, well, I was like the, trying to get out of the office as much as I could. All right, well, just to comment on that. So everyone's worked in offices and like, for example, I get to hire my team and I get to hire people I like. Most people are employees and there's a forced camaraderie. And also there's a discomfort. There's a discomfort level, right? So if, if you can't like, let's say you're in a 10 person office. I can't like all of them. I can't be close to all of them. And I have their ears and eyes on me all the time, which, which is part of what they want you in the office for. You know, because there's this little feeling that you're going to behave better when eyes are on you, even coworkers. So mostly I still talk to my I would still talk to my team members like I'm on vacation. Let's say when I'm on vacation, I talk to them just as much and Zoom with them. And so I think I think people that are working from home ha have as much communication with clients and coworkers that they used to have. It's just not in person. So I don't yeah. find that to be a negative. Um, but but again, it's people are so much more comfortable being home not just because they could be in their sweats. It's not, not just because, oh, someone's not walking behind them looking at their screen. You know, so that forced camaraderie, that's something that's not healthy. I know I always thought that forced camaraderie, like that being in an office is, is very odd. It's like being in a sort of a pen with, a, with other animals who you don't necessarily get along yeah, with. Yeah, right. Well, as... Uh... Dorney Donko says there is more drama than camaraderie. Yeah. 100%. By the end of my career in TV news, I was covering the environment full time and I had secured a take home vehicle. So I had a vehicle I could take home with me and I left four of my stories right from home. Seattle was a pain in the, in the butt to drive through. You'd spend like an hour just getting through the city. And it made no sense if like I was living on the north end of town to drive south into downtown Seattle just to get a vehicle to drive back north another hour to the wilderness where I was doing my story. So I finally had convinced my bosses to give me a take home vehicle, which was awesome. And I had a laptop and edited, I did everything on the road. So like I never went into the office. It was a rare day when I went into the office and I loved it. I mean, the thing is I tell people, you know, there's a lot of negative stuff about the media that's on my channel, but I had a sweet job. Like I gave up a sweet job, um, you know, to like I was, I was winning Emmys. I got a take home vehicle. I'm going hanging out with Wolverines and Orca whales, you know, out in the Puget Sound. Like, I, I remember one time I called my buddy who's the investigative reporter because I was coming back from picking out like uh, Orca poop out of the Puget Sound. And I had to wait for, I had to wait for the ferry. And it was like two hours until the next ferry was going to come. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? She goes, get a couple beers, just hang out and get some dinner, a couple beers. I'm like, can I charge that to the company? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, really? I can, they're not going to, you know, get upset about that. She goes, no, it's your job. Like what else are you supposed to do? I'm like water. She's like, no. So I mean, that, like, people would just do that at our company. And it was, it was just totally normal. But, but if I, somebody made me like, I remember towards the end of it, even then, if somebody had made me start coming back into the office or they put me back on general assignment where it's like, you're going to go cover murders or fires again. And you have to come for the editorial meeting. Cause that was the worst, like sitting through the editorial meeting at nine o'clock or nine 30 in the morning. And then everybody has to have an opinion about every topic. And you're just sitting there like, why am I here? You know, <laughs> like get, right, right. so, so there's so much wasted time in the news business that probably <laughs> if more people work like I did, you get better journalism because they wouldn't have been wasting all their time sitting yeah, in the car. It comes down to productivity. That's why, Fortune 500, you're going to have this problem for a long time. Come to a medium-sized company, which is like between, you know, zero and 200 employees, let's say, my sweet spot, and they just want someone productive. They don't have time to worry about nine to five. They just, can you do the job? They have a hard time finding te technical people. Could I share my screen for a second? Yeah, go ahead. You see where it says present? I got it. Uh, let's see. What happened to phone meetings? I used to just have to call a manager. Now it's expected to be video. Yeah, that's true. I hate that trend too. I hate the whole video. I, it's like just I just use Zoom audio when somebody sends me a Zoom link. I don't even I don't do the video. So just take okay. a look at this. Oakland's crime emergency is a warning to other American cities. Right. This is where a lot of TV reporters that I knew they moved to Seattle from Oakland because they were getting their cameras stolen and everything. <laughs> oh, they were so, on the job. We have this, we have all the stats. Crime is up in all major cities. You can't deny it. Um, so people, so you, if you cannot, cannot, um, 
if, if you cannot keep people safe coming to work, how can you expect them to come to the office every day? Yeah, it's terrible what's happening. Look at San, look at San Francisco. So I wanted to yeah. share that other thing that these companies are not talking about. What is your what is your protocol for safety on the subways in New York to come to your office? They, and they're not they're not yeah, good point. As, so right. So that's oh, it's just, it's just it's a big issue. All these issues people talk about with me and the big companies aren't talking about it. We might you know they're gonna start doing this and people are getting very upset about it already. And again, there's the tide would turn against the big companies only because the leverage is gone. You know, people don't want to go to the office. They have other job opportunities and they love working from home. What's happening with the children? So there's a lot of people that don't need latchkey anymore because they can mm -hmm. take their kids off the bus at three o'clock and they can or and have dinner with them. They're not exhausted from a 90 minute commute at the end of the day. So there's much too much positive. The, the genie's out of the bottle with regard to yeah. remote work and it's never well, going back. The thing is, though, this is interesting. MSLSM saying here, why was there such a push to work remotely starting after 2008 or so? So trying to get everybody out of the office. Now we're reversing course and making everybody come back to the office, uh, taking away laptops. Like every, it's saying basically they got people laptops. You could work out of the office and they were handed out to everybody. Now they want everybody using a desktop. Um, if you don't have a personal device, you'll be in the office five days a week. Why are we reversing course when we just had a big work from home? Event it's not about, it's not about, it's not about productivity. A lot of these companies are in liberally dominated states and cities and they're dying. And part of the reason why they're dying is because of tax revenue, because of people remotely working. So there's no business reason or employee reason really for this to happen. Like I've been saying, and until people start calling the companies out on that, there's not going to be any answer for them. And the companies are going to suffer and the towns are going to continue to suffer. Like, look at San Francisco. Look what's happened with them. And it just boggles my mind. Like, why do they let it happen? Like San Francisco, a very strong city, great place culturally, a stronghold of, of liberal liberalism, which is fine. But they're allowing it to die. The exodus of people, the exodus of high value earners, the exodus of, of businesses in the office space. I would like to talk to, I'd love someone to explain to me. I'm really perplexed. Why are they letting it happen? Why is New York City letting this happen? Why is San Francisco, Seattle, Portland? They're, 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 they're killing themselves with their policies. You know, catch and release, no cash bail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, homeless problems. So all these things, who wants to go back to work in San Francisco? People would be, there are people out, even if they got fired, will not go and rightfully so. And the companies will not address these issues. And the companies are going to be the ones that suffer. Okay. Uh, critical thought. I think that most work from home jobs are at the most risk of replacement by AI, not service workers like truck drivers, restaurant workers, and other blue collar workers. What does Chris think about remote workers being replaced by AI? Well, I think that the more you have to think on multiple kinds of levels, the less likely AI can take your job. So if you're just simply a clerical person, you have to assess what you're doing. Is it something that a machine could do simply? See, it's very hard to AI technical people. Um, like for example, like me. So yes, you can go to Jad GPT and say, what's the depreciation on a vehicle, blah, blah, blah. But there's a million other questions that have to come out of that to get an answer that AI can't do. So if, you're, if your job is clerical, one-dimensional, very surface, very one-step or two-step in what you do, then I'd be very concerned that the AI is going to be replace you. That's really the answer. But if you're a technical person writing, a like writer, for example, or if you're an actuary, you're a CPA, you're a business, uh, even a manager, if, ma managers, good ones who do team sales work, for example, AI can't replace them. The human element has to be there. So... I see that, yes, certain jobs should be made in AI. They should be converted because there really isn't a human thought element. The more you have to think, the less likely you're replaced. That's Bill what I tell says, everybody. Yeah, that's a good point. Bill says the head of KTVU, which is Bay Area news station, is leaving and going to the Northwest. There are a lot of folks that move up to the Portland, Seattle area from the Bay Area. I'm not really sure why. It's not like it's a whole lot better. I mean, it, it is better than Oakland. I, I'm not going to say it's the same, but it's not trending in the opposite direction. Just leave it, leave that at, there. Uh, all right, going over to, I don't have it on my screen, but I just want to go to the live chat over on Locals.
Critical Thought also said this value concept will convert white collar jobs to piecemeal payments, ultimately driving wages down. What do you think about that? Well, no, uh, some, but when I the, the value is that people are bringing the value. There's there's fewer people and fewer that really bring the value, so it's going to increase though that pay, right? So even if it's piecemeal, I do piecemeal work. That's what I do. A tax returns piecemeal work, but I get paid very well for it. So it all depends on what you're bringing and your expertise and the difference in value. If there's a million people that can do what you do, if a million people could do taxes like I could, I'm going to only make five dollars a return. So it yeah. all depends on the specific value you bring. And people are realizing their value and they're starting to get even more money and more more increases in pay because they can they can leave so much easier than they could 25 years ago. Yep. Well, and, um, you know, like you said, there are there's just other options. It seems like other companies are very interested in hiring people like so it's it it doesn't seem like it's hard to find another job right now if you if you want one. Am I wrong about that? I mean, it seems like employers are are more so looking for workers at this point. Um, every day. Um, my, yeah. my, um, I see it in, yes, I see it in the news. I see it in my work that finding people listen. That, and and the, the good thing about medium sized companies or smaller is that they had, we don't have to deal with the DEI and ESG kind of garbage. They don't, they don't have the time. They don't care if you're a, a Muslim trans man coming in in a skirt that can you answer the phone? Can you dig the ditch? Great. You're hired. So really that's, what's good about it. It's all about value. You bring all of that politics and social justice score that doesn't apply. That's why I love to work in the space. I do because we're just dealing with being productive, building wealth, hiring the right people. And we, we don't have time for any of that, that, that layer of surface politics and um, which I, which I, I don't know how people deal with it every day. Okay. Wolfenhaus, Mr. Whalen has some critical thoughts and several well-delivered rational ideas. There you go, Chris. Well, so, well, 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 thanks, Dad. No, I'm just kidding. That's he's Wolfenhaus. <laughs> yeah, it I'm might be kidding. your mom. Uh, okay, Chris Whalen, CPA.com. If you want to get a hold of Chris, he is taking clients. So if you're one of those people, right. you're starting your own company because you're quitting your job somewhere else because they won't let you work from home. 732-673-0510 or chriswhalencpa.com. Um, go check him out. It's just, just, just one more thing. So my a good, a, a good role for me in a company is a lot of times people have CFOs that they overpay. And so usually they, they hire me a la carte for CFO and tax advisory and business advisory services on a monthly basis. So that's a really good, of course, doing your tax work. But a lot of people have me monthly just to have me on call when things come up, just so they bring me into different situations that you'd bring a CFO in. And that's the kind of, I love to do that work also. We do a lot of that here. For instance, and he did this pro bono for us, but Chris helped us figure out how to sell the Airstream when we were moving to Florida. <laughs> because the they, I don't remember what the issue was. It was like something with the title or something like that. Remember Chris, right. we called you last minute. The guy had the money in hand and we're like, what do we do with this title? We don't have to sell right. it. Right. Well, he, well, he, wanted, he wanted you to go to the DMV. Oh yeah, he wanted us to go to the DMV. Remember that? Like, he wanted, and right. I said, we're no, like, no, no, no. We have a t title that's signed, well, not dated, and so we th that's it as is. Take it. The title is a clear title, and we're not coming to explain right. anything. Take it or leave it. Yeah. We're not going to which, the DMV. Which was hilarious. So well, he was like, "Well, I want to make sure I can switch the title over." So you know, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not going to give you my money. So we're like, "Well, right. leave your dad with the money." So his poor right. dad <laughs> sat out. On our lawn, it was like 85 degrees out, which is not that bad, you know, in, in the Pacific Northwest because there's no humidity. And he's just sitting there with, with his cash in hand. Like, right. we're like, do you want to come inside and use the bathroom? He wants some water. He's like, <laughs> he, I think he was actually Russian. He's like, no, no, I'm fine. <laughs> just, just sat there for like two hours till the guy came back. So anyway, yeah, Chris, Chris is a great guy. He's the hardest working guy um, in his field, I'm sure. And uh, he'll do right by you. So thanks, Chris. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Tomorrow, I got Dave Bondi on. He quit TV news, so it should be fun to catch up and hear what he's working on. And um, next week's going to be a big week, too, but I'm not going to tell you. You're just going to have to join locals or just come back for some more. Have a great weekend. See you next time.